Hi there, welcome to um, just a short summary of the offence of theft. I'm going to apologise in advance just in case you can hear my dog snoring in the background. Um, it's pretty chronic so um, just excuse that. So we're just going to go through the offence of theft which to be fair most students really do well at. Um, that's because it follows a fairly straightforward format. So what that means is if you're going to answer a theft question you're going to have to do better than everybody else and to do that you're going to have to really focus on bringing in your case law and really the nuances of what the rules say. So this is a statutory area of law. So it was made and defined in the Theft Act 1968. It's a tribal either way offence, which means it can be heard either at the magistrate's court or at the Crown Court, depending on things like the, the severity of the circumstances of the theft, etc. So theft covers quite a lot of different circumstances and, and it can be sort of theft of a Mars bar all the way to, to theft of really expensive um, items. So it covers a very wide range. So there's different ways that you can approach a theft question. So what I'm going to do is just to recap simply by going through the orders of the sections. Um, you may group it into actus reus and mens rea, it doesn't really matter. So first thing that you need to know is that section one of the Theft Act 1968 gives you the definition of the offence of theft. So the dishonest appropriation of property belonging to another with the intention of permanently depriving the other of it. The, the following sections just try and break down what those words are intended to mean. So the first word I mentioned was dishonest. Dishonest is found in section two. Or I should say it's referred to in section two because actually Parliament didn't bother defining the word dishonest, uh, possibly because it's one of those concepts that is really hard to pin down and define. But they felt that it's a common sense word that magistrates and juries would be able to um, apply. Now that assumes a common standard of morality, which um, I'm not convinced everyone has. So this is why we need sort of the three magistrates or the 12 members of the jury to come to an agreement on what they believe. So all section two does tell us is that there are um, some exceptions to dishonesty. In other words, behaviour that is considered not dishonest, behaviour that would be considered acceptable. So section 2 a um, we believe that it's acceptable if you take property believing that you have a legal right. Um, so for example, the case of Robinson is really important here. Um, in Robinson, they were fighting and he took a five pound note that fell out of the, the other person's pocket. He took it believing he had a right to it because the guy's wife owed it to him. Section 21B is if you believe that the owner would consent. So this, this might be, for example, if you know the person, the owner of the property really well. So in Holden, he took tyres from his employer's workshop, thinking the owner would consent because other staff did it. And that's even though his contract specifically said he wasn't allowed to take things. Finally, we have section 21C, which is where we believe that the owner can't be found through taking reasonable steps. So in the case of Small, he thought the car had been abandoned and didn't think the owner could be found through reasonable steps, even though, of course, you would just contact the, the police or the DVLA and track the registration um, plate. Now, all of these are based on the defendant's genuine, honest belief. Even if that belief is a bit silly or unreasonable, like in small, as long as that person genuinely believed these, then they're not being dishonest. Now, if these exceptions apply, one of them applies, then the law says they aren't being dishonest, so therefore it can't be theft. If none of those apply, though, we're still in the same situation where we we're struggling to judge whether this person's behaviour is right or wrong. Um, we use the Gauche test until very recently. This has now been overruled or taken over, I should say, by that Ivy test in the case of Ivy versus Genting Casino. So that was originally a civil case. But it has been confirmed in R versus Barton and Booth in 2020 that we should be using the Ivy test from now on. So that's what we're going to use. So the Ivy test um, differs from the Gauche test in that it takes away that element of whether the defendant felt their behaviour was right or wrong. Instead, what we do is we look at what the defendant's knowledge was in the circumstances that they were in. So, for example, did they know they were taking something or was it an accident or did they understand that, generally speaking, it might be seen as cheating or, or things like that? Based on what that person knew and understood the situation to be, based on the situation, we then apply an objective standard. 
what would ordinary decent people think of this person's behaviour? Would reasonable, ordinary, decent people judge their behaviour as dishonest? So for example, it could be that in Ivy, although he genuinely believed he wasn't cheating, he, he knew that he was um, trying to adjust the odds through edge sorting. He knew that he was trying to do something a bit different and ordinary people the court felt would judge that behaviour as dishonest. Clever, but dishonest. So when it comes to dishonesty, when it comes to the first element of the mens rea, check the exceptions and then use this test as a decider. What, what would ordinary people think of that person's behaviour based on what they were doing and what they knew and what was going on? Then you need to decide the next word, which is appropriation, something that students kind of struggle to get right. It's the assumption of the owner's rights with or without consent. So I've just given some uh, little examples there of things that could be an assumption of the owner's rights. It's not just taking. It could be selling something. It could be destroying something. It could be switching the price tags, as we saw in R versus Morris, for example. And the key is that it does. Um, it doesn't matter if you're looking at whether the person had consent or not. That is a mens rea issue. Instead, what we're just looking at is, did that person do something that only the owner should be able to do? So I've already mentioned Morris. Hmm. It's going to be a bit messy because it's a funny angle. Um, it can include a later assumption of rights. So perhaps originally you were just borrowing an item like a library book and then later on you assume the rights of the owner by keeping it, not returning it, destroying it, something like that. So it doesn't have to be something that's straight away. Also, you remember in R versus Morris, as soon as we switched the price tags, that was doing something only the owner can do. So it didn't matter if he went to the till or not, the crime was already done. It also includes things like gifts. So um, you could refer to uh, the case of Lawrence with uh, the, the money or um, you could talk about the case of Hinks where the the woman was being given these gifts of cash um, by, by the man. They're still appropriating th that cash. Whether they were allowed to, whether they were given it by consent is a separate issue. They were still doing something that only the owner can do. Next up. We need to think about this idea of what can be stolen for the purposes of theft. So the Theft Act itself actually went through and listed five categories of things that would be recognised as property that can be stolen. So money, so uh, coins, banknotes, real property, which is land and buildings. There are some exceptions of when of, of how this works, but we don't need to know about those for A-level. Personal property essentially is your belongings and covers the majority of things. So your, your phone, your wallet, your car, your keys, um, your dinner, your sandwich, your pet. Things in action. Um, things in action are probably easiest described as a, as a legal right to do something. Um, so for example, if you think of a bus ticket, you're not actually buying the piece of paper itself. You want to buy the right to ride the bus or you know, same with a cinema ticket, you're not really paying for the piece of paper, you're paying for the right to go and enjoy the cinema. Uh, other intangible property as well can be stolen, so things like um, patents or electricity, Wi-Fi, things like that. There are some things, however, that won't be classed as property that can be stolen for the purposes of theft. And two of these are mentioned in section four themselves. So wild plants can't be stolen, so that means if you go um, to the woods and you, you pick some daisies or whatever, then you're not going to be liable for a crime. Or if you go, you know, blackberry picking, wild um, hedgerows, that's all acceptable, unless it's for sale. So unless you're doing that for reward, sale or some sort of commercial purpose, then it becomes property that can be stealable. Wild animals also can't be stolen. So um, if, if you sort of have a habit of, of catching ladybirds or butterflies or... Um, if, if you took a, a wild rabbit home, those things wouldn't be classed as property that's stealable unless someone else has reduced it into their possession, then it can become stealable. So, for example, if I catch a wild rabbit in the woods and then you take it from me, that would be theft because I've reduced that rabbit in my possession. There has been a couple of other clarifications that have had to come from case law because they're not sort of discussed in the act. Um, body parts are not classed as property. So um, if someone accidentally chops off their finger and you take it, that's not theft. 
unless it's been altered and, and given new um, virtues. So the case that that came from is Kelly and Lindsay. So because those organs were essentially being used for, for training purposes, for uh, medical training, the court said they've been sort of changed. They've been given um, different attributes by virtue of the application of skill. So they're not just body parts anymore. They are body parts for medical use. Information also can't be stolen, although there may be other alternative crimes that a person might be charged with, like, for example, fraud or, or um, looking at copyright law. So information is not property that can be stolen. And this was decided in the case of Oxford versus Moss. Although remember, if it's on, for example, a piece of paper, the piece of paper could be stolen. This is a common exam scenario. So I'll have a look at the format that the information has been taken. If you were to take a photo of the information with your phone, for example, that wouldn't be theft. Um, it's, it's whether you actually take the, the physical um, holder, if you like. That property has to belong to another. So belonging to another can cover a wide range of things. So it means ownership, but it also includes possession and control. So this is, remember, why you can steal your own property. So in the case of R versus Turner, when he went to pick up the car from the garage without paying, although it was his car, it was actually lawfully in the garage's possession or control because they had the right to it until he paid to, to take it back. There are a couple of exceptions that the law talks about quite clearly where something like money can be in your possession and control, but it doesn't actually belong to you. It still belongs to another. So two clear exceptions. So the first is if it's given for a specific purpose or obligation. And we can talk about the case of Davidge versus Bunnett here. Davidge versus Bunnett, she was given money. It was in her possession and control, but it didn't belong to her because it was given for the gas bill. And she went and spent it on Christmas presents. It can also be given to you by mistake and then it doesn't belong to you because you're obliged to return it. And that usually happens if it's a part of a legal contractual obligation. So for example, um, in the case of Gilts, he was overpaid in gambling um, stakes. He didn't have to return that money because it, at the time it wasn't a legally recognized gambling transaction. However, in the Attorney General's reference number three, um, the policewoman was overpaid in her wages. Sadly, you have to pay those wages back because you've worked in agreement for a certain fee. You're not entitled to any more than that fee. So when they were given an overpayment, they were obliged to return it. Keeping it was theft, even though she didn't spend it because keeping it is something only the owner should be doing. Um, going back to mens rea then, so the, the sort of last main part that you need to talk about in the exam is what intending to permanently deprive means. And that essentially means treating, keeping disposing of it as if it's your own to do so. So you're gonna keep it, you're not gonna return it, you're gonna do things with it. So remember one of the key cases, um, Valumal. Oh, what's spelling? Valumal. That case said that even though the um, defendant took money from a safe intending to return it, it wouldn't be returning the exact same coins and banknotes. So that was still intending to permanently deprive them of those notes. And that could be theft. And you have to think of the wider policy things here. Otherwise, everyone would do it. Employees would take money and swear they were going to return it the next day. Um, it could be that you take something and you use some of it and you return, intend to return it. So, for example, um, taking someone's Metro card and using some of the credit, but then returning the Metro card itself. Did you intend to permanently deprive? Well, we've seen that the case of Lloyd, which is the one with the cinema film reels. The cinema film reels were returned in their original condition and they could be used exactly like they could before by the owner. Therefore, they weren't permanently deprived of the use of this film reels. They could use them again and again. So... The court said we have to ask, is the goodness, virtue, practical value diminished of those products? Now, again, we don't have a lot of guidance. It's a question of proportion. So if you took someone's metro card that has £20 on it and they use a pound and then return it, the goodness, virtue, practical value hasn't been fully diminished. So they haven't really permanently deprived the person of that, um, that travel card. However, if you give it back with sort of 10p remaining, Although they've given you back the travel card, clearly the goodness, virtue and practical value of it has been reduced. So it's just a question of proportion. If 
you're ever not sure in the exam, just argue both sides and just make sure you show the examiner that you understand that's the test. The last sort of relevant section of the Theft Act 1968 that you may wish to talk about is simply the sentence. And it's really easy to remember because section seven gives you the maximum seven years imprisonment for theft. And again, that's a maximum. Anything below that can be given depending on the circumstances. So I hope you found that useful. Go through your handouts, keep adding cases to kind of show these different things in action. And um, I will continue looking at other property offences.